Yo, episode two, on the camera we back. We told y'all we was gonna get some guests. We got some pretty good guests. I mean, these are some, yeah, these are some of the most popular people. Yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, ahead go ahead and introduce much. yourselves. What's going on, y'all? My name is David Stewart. Um, I'm currently a junior studying business marketing professional sales at ASU. That's too. My name's Ariana. I'm an ASU grad. Um, I'm a business major. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And real quick, real quick, you graduated early though, right? Yeah. Talk about that. Talk about graduating early. How, how does that feel? Honestly, like, I feel like I downplay it a lot. Uh, don't give myself enough credit, but I did work really hard. I graduated high school an associate's degree. Um, so I should have graduated in two years, but I was like, I'm not low-key ready. To two years? It. Yeah, two I should have graduated yeah. in two. But I two wasn't years. ready to do all that. I wasn't ready to go in the real world. Still don't feel ready, but I had to do it. Um, it's a big accomplishment. So. I got. I gotta ask though. How many credits were you taking? Like to graduate in three, but even in two, how many credits were you taking a semester? I was taking like the normal credits Would since I graduated with the associates, but it was just hard coming into school with that because I was a fresh freshman taking like three hundred level classes off bat. So. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, starting it off. Um, we brought y'all here because, I mean, we've known you for about a year now. We've known David since freshman year, so going Shout on three years Kofa. now. Shout out to Sankofa. Um, speaking of Sankofa, kind of talk about your leadership roles um, and what you guys have been involved in at your time at ASU and how that has kind of shaped your experience. Uh, um, I guess I can go ahead and just start off with just me coming in as a high school senior going into freshman year. I think that we had a very unique experience, actually all four of us together, because we came in all during COVID. And so the impact of COVID definitely was something that was felt by all of us. Like, I'm sure y'all remember, like, we used to have to go to school, wear masks to classes, spaced out. I was a little D, bro. Yeah. It was kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, but, like, really, like, just the experience just being at ASU was really, like, impacting and really something that I feel like was special to me because I was originally going to go to Prairie, uh, Prairie View in Texas. HBCU. Um, I liked the culture at ASU and they gave me the most money, so I ended up choosing ASU. And by being a part of programs like Sankofa, which is dedicated to the betterment um, of students, in particular with African American students, it aims for those because we end up a lot of time being the ones that tend to drop out. Um, so by having the structural support of a program like that, you have educational success, community development. Um, it really helped me meet y'all. Like, to have that community established. And so now, um, this past year, I just was director of the program, overseeing the whole program. Um, and now I'm also part of this organization called MASU, which is African American Men at ASU. I'm currently the president of that organization. So it's just been a lot of good opportunities. Um, we really met my people out here. Hey man, that's that's what we love to hear, man. Black men leading, man. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Talk about that, man. Hey man, <laughs> ain't nothing that I root harder for than a black man or woman succeeding. I cannot yeah, lie. Course, I cannot like, lie. Like what David said, bro, Sankofa, that's probably one of the best, if not the best experience. That no, I it's had different though, because I, I was in You didn't even have it, yeah. Yeah, I just. Oh, like, that's right. What? Yeah. I just showed up. Yeah, you showed up. So, what's up? But, like, yeah. over, I would say, oh, a good percentage of my friends that I have even now were from Sankofa. Yeah. They were from that. Talk about, talk, for people who don't know about what Sankofa is, talk about that in like coming in freshman year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll let David, I'm going to pass it to David as well, but. We came in, I came in, we came in like a week, a week before all the other freshmen did um, in 2021 in, the, in August. And basically we showed up, there was like, well, it was like a little meeting at the beginning. Where yeah, we just got to, 50 students. Yeah, 50, it was a lot of heads, bro. It was a lot of people. We introduced ourselves and then it was on from there, bro. Like we had, we had all, a lot of events. What else did we do? You can go, go into depth of just like what you guys did this summer too. Yeah. So um, to go, I'm gonna first start off with my experience from my freshman year. Um, so with our class, it was a little different, um, obviously, just because of, uh, you know, with any program that you host, you wanna make sure you got improvements. And I think for my freshman year, um, one of the biggest things that was really like critical for us was the retention. Because as the days went on, folks were like, oh, why do we gotta be here? It's hot and everything. You know, I don't feel like being outside and we gotta like walk all these different places. But what you fail to realize at the time, and I think that Keith kind of backed me up on this, is that when you're making those relationships and really just taking those small moments to talk to other people, you are building relationships like unconsciously. Like, 
all like, I mean, we still had a great time, but like, even just with my director, Julian Flanagan, like, shout out to him. Like, shout that was, he was, he you know, his, he did his thing. Yeah. Shout out to, I don't know. Yeah, hey, no, he's doing good things though right now too, but like, you know, just being a part of that program in particular and like just making those connections, you missed it as soon as that first week hit because you realize, yeah. like, dang, like, now all my homies are in downtown, Poly, West, wherever they're at. I'm not seeing them every day. I was seeing y'all for like hours, hours, hours. like the like full day. We eight, were, ten we were, hours. Yeah, we wake up and go straight to the straight to the, the first event. event. Exactly. And then even if the even if the events closed. Like and everything was done, we were still going out and we were still doing other no, things. No, we were until hanging like, out, man. Like, until like two a.m. and we were getting yeah. up. It was like six hours in between where we weren't doing anything. But yeah, I would say like David said, those connections they're gonna last a lifetime, I think. And it was a it was a perfect event. Well, I mean, speaking of that, I mean, how how has your guys's experience at ASU has been, especially because ASU is a PWI. Let's let's keep it a buck. Like it's like what. 80 probably percent white people. Yeah, yeah. the percentage is crazy. And like what? what? It's, it's, it's got a little so up. Four, 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 five four, percent. Four yeah. percent black? Four, so, five percent. you know, coming in, um, I know from my uh, experience, you know, I came knowing no one, yeah. Um, yeah. which is kind of different from y'all because at least y'all had a little head start with it. Getting, especially getting to meet black people on campus. Yes. I feel like that's such a big thing for me because when I first came out here, um, that was the first thing I did. I looked for the black right. people. I looked for Keith. I looked for David. You know what I'm saying? And it it really helped me, but at the same time, it it, it you know, it was kind of scary too. You know, come into a place where, you know, it's a new environment. It's it's you know new people, and it it's not a lot of the same people that I'm used to seeing. I grew up going to you know, a black church. I'm African, so I have a whole you know African side to me, and. I really had to go digging for that, especially as a freshman, where I feel like at HBCUs, it's just naturally, yeah, authentically yeah. there. Um, what do you feel about that? Um, well, I feel, I came in the year before y'all, so I came in yeah. literally like COVID, like we was in the dorms, we wasn't having class, we wasn't oh, yeah. seeing people face to face, nothing. Um, and I didn't do Sankofa. Um, I kind of wish I did though, but they, I actually signed up, but then they're like, we're going to do it on Zoom. So I was like, I'm not doing that, you know? Um, yeah, I wish I, yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, was nah, awesome. you know? But looking back at it, I wish I would have done it just because like, I feel like only having that online sense of college kind of made it like that much harder to be able to find the black clubs or like the black organizations, let alone just black people. Um, the thing that honestly kind of helped me the most, and I think honestly was the hardest, uh, well, first off, what the hardest thing was for me was having to actively like go out and search for community, search for your people is honestly really tiring. Um, especially, I came from, I'm from Seattle. So Seattle is really diverse. I grew up around a lot of diversity, not necessarily just black people, but just diversity. You come to ASU, it's not really that. <laughs> like we said, it's 4% black. I don't know the other percentage, percentage judges, yeah. <laughs> but um i feel like that was the hardest part for me was having to like actually go out and look for people uh the thing that kind of helped me was i don't know if your classes had this but we had like the little class of 2024 page yeah yeah bro yeah. but i would literally scroll for like hours on there trying, trying to, to find, find black people, people. Yeah. <laughs> Like if I seen one follow, like DM, hey, you looking for a roommate? Hey, I'm coming to campus, what campus you on? And I think that kind of helped me coming into ASU. Um, but yeah, it was just really hard. You felt really lost, really lonely. If it wasn't for like that uh, social media aspect of it, I probably would have came here like, bruh, because I didn't know anyone either, yeah. so. I wanna, I wanna ask you something real quick. Since yeah. you said that you were online pretty much like your whole first year, what were you guys doing? Like, was there any activities like going out? Or were you guys just literally just in the dorms all day, every day, just posted up, cooked up? Yeah, Zoom, Zoom classes, and that's it. Like, what were you guys? That's doing? not even college, bro. Nah, no, it's not it college. was. I think first semester, it was pretty much just, yeah, we was cooped up in the dorms, not doing anything, no events on campus. I think like the SDFC was open, but they had like, it blocked out. So like only 30 people could be in the gym at a time. And then I think second semester when stuff started getting better um, is when like 
the BAC started to pop out and like yeah. put events up and stuff. And so then I found it finally and started going to that stuff, which actually helped. Like I met a lot of the people we all know, like Haley, all them. Like I met them at that point. Um, but yeah, first semester was just me and my five little friends I met on Instagram. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I was just chilling. Yeah, we were just chilling. I mean, talk about that too. Um, you know, David, you know, uh, like you said, you're involved in Amasu, you're involved in Sarakofa. What are the benefits, I guess, of, of, you know, for black kids to come and have a club like, you know, BAC, have clubs like Amasu, you know, or Issa, you know, what I'm in, yeah. e e uh, Ethiopian Eritrean uh, club. You know, what are the benefits to that? I, I feel like it just kind of gives a sense of like home in a way. I feel like, I feel like, you know, especially like how she was talking about, she had, you know, COVID restrictions. Yeah. You know, you couldn't even go to the gym, which that, if y'all don't know, that was the most annoying thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most annoying thing ever. Even, yeah, they had that, that was what, second semester, even yeah. more freshman year? Really, it was you, still it was still yeah. 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 yeah, bro, we had to check in, like, we would have to make a, like, wake up in the Reservation. morning. Yeah. And, like, yeah. I would have to wake really up early in the morning. Gym. Yeah. Like, come on, bro. Like, and it's like 20, it's like 20 heads. You know, big yeah. gym. Yeah, and it was really like, it was really like, you know, like, for concert tickets. Like, yeah. if you, you know, if you get up at a certain time, you, you want to get going. And then, yeah, good, like, like, good luck with the hooping, with any sort of like playing any sports. So all that was shut down. So that's what I'm saying. The connectivity really wasn't there because COVID was messing it up. So, I mean, that's why I feel like the importance of these black clubs really. Especially being on a PWI, bro. Um, if y'all don't know what that is, it's just basically like predominantly white institution. Yeah. Tell them. <laughs> Tell them. Yeah. But I mean, just talk about that, especially from a leadership's perspective that you had now. Like, you came in as a freshman, as just a member, and now you kind of climb the ranks. Um, so you hit on a couple of good points. Um, and I'm going to try to take this real segment and try to be real organized when I say this. So ASU has what, like 180,000 heads? Just on yeah. the, enrolled at ASU. Um, with that being said, you know you have five percent, but like we're going back to what we're talking about with St. Kofa, you know we got lucky because we we're able to see a group of black people that had chose to sign up for an organization that was, you know, made really to to better the experience of black students. But for other students like yourself, Dawi or for you, Ari. It's very few and far in between to find a black student when you have a, a predominantly white institution. That's just a fact. Like, it, it's just, you're so sparse. Even though there are black people here, it's just hard to even find them. Um, and so for me, I came in here really looking to just get myself connected and get myself out there because I knew, I recognized, like, if I don't do it right now, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I'm going to hate my experience. And I didn't want that for my freshman year. And so I really just made an effort really just to go meet people. And if it weren't for the influences from like Sankofa, mainly like Elias and like Caleb, like they were really like pushing for me to get involved in stuff when even I wasn't really necessarily like ready for it. Um, I didn't feel comfortable like, you know, necessarily going into clubs and organizations like, dang, I just got here. That's the thing. And I, I'm so appreciative to this day for them like, you know, Nolan and all them, like, hey, get involved with the Masu, meet other people, because these are communities that are, are built and are focused on having a structure. And so when you have students that, you know, I've been blessed to be able to have a household that has, you know, both parents um, within the household that encourage college, but not everybody's going to be like that. And a lot of the time within our communities, it's not like that. You know, you have students that come here that they're the first in their families to be getting a college degree. You got students that maybe mom or dad is like, you know, really like you got to break out of your, your uncle, you know, whoever your comfort maybe, zone. But that was really pouring into them, that really pushed them to get to this sort of space. But when you go into college, there's not going to be that hand to tell you, hey, you need to do this, that, and the third. And so if you still got habits and you still have things that you're, you know, continually doing while in college, nobody's going to be there correcting. And so by being a part of organizations like Amasu, being a part of organizations like BBSA, or just the BAC, just in general, you're surrounded by a community that can be there to correct you, even when you don't want to hear it. If I fail the test, nobody's gonna be like, dang, well you gave it the hardest. I want somebody in my corner that's like, hey, you could have done better, and I know that you probably got a C on that test, but let's do better next time. Let's get act, you know, let's go to tutor and let's 
you know, meet somebody that's in your major. You know, these are the sort of connections that I made that pushed me to be in the position that I'm in right now. And so, by getting connected to the BAC, getting connected to all these different, you know, organizations, I feel like, in a way, I've met my black community and I feel very safe at ASU, within the black community at ASU. Um, I don't know if I necessarily feel any regret to not go to HBCU because this is not a diss towards any HBCUs, but like I know some of my friends too, they're not necessarily feeling comfortable within that space too. Because a lot of people don't realize too, like when you go to HBCU, you're not just gonna have friends out the, the one way, like you just gotta, you actually have to make a point to meet people. And so I feel like that's a universal experience across all colleges. And so the, the good thing about here is that we recognize, I feel like, I don't know, like there's a, a select amount of us so we really have a, a passion and a drive to make sure when I see a black student, I'm going to talk to them about the BAC. I'm going to share the information about a model. So I'm going to share the information about other organizations that I feel like they would be, you know, interested in. Yeah, preach, preach it. No, no. no, but I mean, you hit a point there because I feel like that was one of the questions I kind of wanted to get into. Do you guys ever wish that, you know, you chose a different school besides ASU or a PWI and went to HBCU? Because Especially, I know around this time, man, it's homecoming. And it's, and it's, yeah. it's popular. Yeah, you just went to, yeah, yeah talk about how was that, 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 that HBCU experience, that you experienced at least, different from what you experienced at you went to, uh, ASU, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I just went to Texas Southern's homecoming. Um, honestly, for me, it was kind of a culture shock. Um, I'm not from, I've never been surrounded by that many black people, which I actually loved. I really loved the culture. It was, it was, it was really cool to see and see the community there. Um, but I didn't like, I found myself like just looking everywhere. Like people literally would come up to me and be like, you don't go here, huh? I was like, nah, go to ASU, Arizona State, my bad. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like going from there to, or going from here to there, I think seeing the culture was the thing that was kind of the most impactful because like yeah we see it in our little like BAC group but as soon as you step out of that space it's gone yeah. and so um, I think that was kind of the thing I took in the most and besides that it was fun the only hard thing was because I see a lot like on TikTok about how people feel like HBCUs are all like competition da da da, da. honestly it did feel like that like that was kind of the hard part about being there is and t people being able to tell I wasn't from there I was kind of like dang but yeah. it was fun I had a lot of fun really like the culture really like the community I just like Houston but yeah it was a good time I think I think the one for me even though we're hosting to answer like the question about the HBCUs for me the biggest deal deal breaker if I'm being honest was the facilities bro yeah like the facilities for the HBCUs are just not the same like the resources that we have here at ASU, I mean, we have these studio quality equipment that we're recording a podcast on for free. Like, it's, I think the opportunity at ASU that we had just to further pursue our careers and get a jump start in the in the real world, I think that yeah, was the deal. I mean, there's a, there's a difference, though, I feel like, between what type of facilities and what you're going for. Because I feel well, like exactly. if, you go, if, you go, if you go to Howard, I feel like that's a very yeah. prestigious community, especially they have a great journalism program, I know too. Yeah. But at the same time, you do see those videos of people yeah. in the dorms and stuff, and then like, <laughs> well, pool water is filling up well, the... I took, I took a trip to Morehouse, right? Yeah. I took a trip to Morehouse in April, April of 2021, like right when I was about to make my decision of what I was gonna do. And it was just bad, bro. Yeah. I think maybe just, maybe, I know it's not all HBCUs, but that Morehouse experience, bro, I just, it just wasn't. It it you. just wasn't there and it just wasn't me I just and I, I don't want it to sound like anything close to like I don't have any desire to be at HBCU because if the opportunity was there and it was the right situation yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, right. Gonna, I'm making I'd rather be around more of my people right and you know yeah I think comfortability yeah. was too I think it's all about situation I think one thing that I think we really miss out big on at ASU compared to HBCU is like the black frat culture too yeah I feel like at ASU, it is there because, you know, we, we just had, you know, like a week ago, the little step show and a lot of people did show up. But while the the establishments may not be there, may be there, um, I feel like the involvement isn't as big. Like when, when you, may, yeah. Can I add on to this? So two things, first of all, uh, I'm gonna go back to HBCUs and I'm gonna come back to the, uh, the Black Friend. 
So with HBCUs, my mom and my sister both graduated from Howard. Um, and I know that they had a fantastic experience. I visited Howard on multiple occasions and it just wasn't the right college for me. And I think that that's important, which we were talking about a little bit earlier, understanding what your priorities are and making the decision based off of what your priorities are. My sister enjoyed being around a community that looked like her all the time. She enjoyed the, the facilities, she enjoyed the clubs that they had there, she enjoyed basically everything, even for the professors. I think that that's one thing about HBCUs that we kind of miss here at the PWI. You have professors that are looking to see your success. At ASU, sometimes it can feel like a number. I've had freshmen, in freshman year in particular, you know, with lecture halls and everything, you know, you got 300 students in one room. No connection. They're not going to be able to be there and tell you, hey, I noticed that you got a C on this test. Yeah, no, exactly. there's, no, there's no connection at all. But at HBCU, because they recognize the importance of having black students succeed, they're going to get on you. Um, but the only issue is that there's not an allocation, like you said earlier, with resources, but in particular, financially. Um, the private donors that are, that are, you know, mainly the ones that are funding a lot of the HBCUs, but there's just not a whole lot of support um, from the back end when it comes to, you know, from alumni or just even private donors, but an established institution like ASU is just going to have that. Um, so I think when it comes to just for a solution, I think just for our community, just giving back and making an effort to give back, even when you don't feel like it, like making a $5,000 grant when you have a six-figure income, even though you want to spend your money on a, a car or something like that, get back to the community that's going to be able to better others. Um, so that's all I got to say about HBCUs. When it comes to black frat culture, I think that that's an improvement, um, or really just like Greek culture, I'm sorry I said frat, um, but Greek culture in particular, I don't feel like ASU does a good enough job, in my personal opinion, of supporting black Greeks. Thank you. Um, I feel like, you know, even when it comes to just the GLV, you know, you have a lot of, you know, Panhellenic Council, they have their own, you know, Greek row and the whole little apartments that they have there. And they just have, you know, monuments to acknowledge black Greeks. And I mean, that's cool, but you don't provide housing, but you don't provide an experience that makes students want to be like, hey, I want to be a part of a community like that outside of what the, 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 the morals are. And I feel like, in particular with black Greek organizations, you, <laughs> Sure, giving back to the community is what they focus on, you know, academic excellence, but there's also just an experience, I feel like, from being just an undergraduate, un undergraduate student that crossed whatever Greek organization you crossed at, because it's like, you know, just the whole experience, not just that. You know, meeting other people, making those connections, going out to different events and stuff, and a lot of the time, you know, the school will, will sponsor that. When I've seen that, a lot of HBCUs, the schools sponsor Black Greeks, they support black Greeks, and I just don't really see that here. So I feel like that's part of the issue. We just don't see support. I want to I wanna kind of shift real quick um, away from just like general questions and kind of get to know you guys a little bit more personally and talk about more of the real world, like meaning you're done with college already. And then you also, you had a big internship in New York, the summer yes. that, that, that people would, would like to know about. But first, Ariel, I want to ask you, after graduation now, you're in a new chapter of life. What have you been doing to, to kind of grow as an adult? If I'm being completely honest and open, this has probably been like the hardest transition, hardest part of my life. Um, just in looking at who I am, what I want to do, what my future is going to look like. Um, I feel like when you go to school for what, 21 plus years, most people 22, that's all you know is school. Um, so I feel like I kind of just got cut off and I see my friends still in school, like y'all still in school, like my best friends are still in school and I'm kind of like, dang, like I'm not doing nothing right now like with my life. Mind you, I already have a whole degree, yes. but uh, right now I'm basically just working. I work at Nike, I have an internship with the Cardinals, and then I coach volleyball. So nothing like big time. Um, I would say the Cardinals is pretty big time. That's it's, a, it's, okay. Oh, that's a <laughs> it's okay, but like, I don't know. Like, I feel like, especially like with graduating, um, I kind of have gotten peace with this because a lot of the people I talk to are like, going through the same thing. Yeah. You never really know what you want to do. You never know what the right path is, um, especially since I majored in psychology. That's not a direct major. Like, you don't go into something directly as you would with like, uh, majoring in nursing or something like that, which 
the key, I wish I would have done something else. But anyways, that's not the point. Um, yeah, it's just been hard, a hard transition that, that way. Um, and it just kind of feels like I'm failing, even though I'm not. But if I'm being honest, that's how it feels in my eyes. Right? Yeah. I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned recently, and I can't speak because I haven't graduated yet <laughs> on that matter, but one of the most important things is patience. Because even though things may not be in front of your face right at that specific moment when you wanted it to be, it will come in due time as long as you are driven, as long as you're committed to keep going. Because if you are over here, you know, just sitting there not doing anything, that's where you're going to find, because stagnation, you, that's, that's where you're going to find nothing. But like you said, you still giving back to the community through volleyball. You still had a job at Nike. You got an internship working for an NFL uh, 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 team. There's ways in which you're progressing. Even though you may not see the big success right now, you're still progressing. And I think for anybody else that is in that sort of situation, as long as you keep going, as long as you keep driving towards something that you find an interest in, you're going to find success. It just may not be immediate. Yeah, that's all I got to say. That's it. Yeah. Bro, like, yeah. I, I really think you should like run for president. Like the way like you're talking right now, like it's just drawn. Bro, you yeah, it is, very bro. well. Bro, you. I would think, bro, you need to consider like ASU student body president. Politician. I don't know you can do that. I don't know about that, brother. I'm telling you, bro. And real quick, talking about like leadership again, I want to kind of circle back to you, David. With with Amasu and um, BAC and some of the other clubs that you're around, what what is the key, like, what are you guys trying to do to create a great black experience? Like, what are the three, if it had to be three talking points or three key things, what would it be to grow the black experience? So first of all, um, I'm going to first start off with the Masu. Our aims is to be, we want to retain our students, recruit students, and graduate our students. Now, for when I was running for president last uh, spring, one of the biggest things that I really wanted to focus on was mentorship, professional development, and also fellowship. I think for our men in particular, our black men, those three things are probably our biggest needs. Um, and I think uh, this could strictly just be my own opinion. But when you see students that either can't pay for college and they end up being black men, or they can't find a community, and the first option is just to drop out because I'm just not familiar with the space, I'm not familiar with the culture, you know, where we come from, you know, we had a diversity of the, everywhere, it's everywhere, it's, it's, but it's, in California too, you also have pockets, and so going back to what I was talking about earlier, if you surrounded, let's say you in South Central LA, and you're from a foundation, that's a beautiful community, but they don't have a lot of time, the foundation to tell people to go to college, and so one of the biggest things I really wanted to focus on this year, which I think I've been doing a pretty decent job of, is getting people exposed to internships, getting people to have their resumes together, getting people to have their cover letters together, and also socializing and connecting with other organizations that we can feed into as well. And I think that that's really important because if you want to have cohesive, cohesiveness, yeah, cohesiveness, that's the word? Yeah. Okay. If you want to have cohesiveness, you have to be the one to be proactive. And so by being proactive, by allowing students to get their eyes exposed to, to having a decent resume, I know and I have the full confidence to know when they step into an interview, when they step and they greet the CEO or the CFO or the CEO, for that matter, they're going to be able to shake their hand, hello, my name is so-and-so, I do this at the third, boom, it's all together. Because they had the structure and the mentorship from somebody that may be an older person, because we, we also do fellowship through uh, the Boole, shout out to Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, they do excellent work with our, our organization as well. But they're meeting people like this that are successful black men. You know, these, these folks are, are doing things within the community and are, are high successes. Not, you know, they haven't just owned a business, they have multiple businesses. They're entrepreneurs, they're dentists, they're lawyers, they're, you know, they're really the top of their game. That's what I'm saying. I, I think it's, it's so important to, especially as a, a black kid in America in general, just to see faces that show you that you can make it, that it, it is possible for so I mean for me a lot of the stuff like that I felt I was interested in uh, in my major right now sports journalism one of my biggest role models was Stephen A. Smith just because yeah. of where he came from how hard he worked and he showed like if you put in the, the work 
like you said, it'll eventually come through. But also, I feel like just talking on your points right now, I feel like around sophomore, junior year is where we kind of flip that switch from, hey, we're in college to now looking forward. And, and, and I feel like that's the biggest shift I kind of felt too, um, especially this summer and, you know, even with this, this podcast right here. Yeah. You know, this is something that I want to, you know, do for the rest of my life. I want to do media. I want to, you know, be on podcasts and, and talking. But I feel like the only way you're going to know what you're good at or what you can do in the future, and like Ariana talking about it, the future is scary. Future is scary. I Thanks. I still don't know what's going to happen after college. I could go a whole different route. Right. But if you don't at least try and put yourself out there, then how are you going to know what you, you can accomplish? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's It's... But it is kind of scary too. I will no, not it's, lie. It's scary for sure. But I mean, like you said, I think we every all of us we just have like just a drive. I think it was like a flip that kind of switched in our heads. I, I know you probably felt yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like it's yeah, just it yeah, just like the closer and closer that we're getting to a professional life, it's scary. But I mean, it's what we gotta do. We gotta face it. We gotta take it head on. And we're in control. That's the main thing. Like we're in control of everything that we do. We're in control if we want to have a successful life, have a successful career. Absolutely. Because we're the ones. The power of the mind is yeah, different, man. We're the ones waking up every single day, motivated or not. Are we going to do this? Like, on those days that you don't want to get up and go go do a podcast, you don't want to edit a video, or like for you, you don't want to get up and be the president for an organization. For you, you have multiple jobs or multiple things that you got going on. You don't want to do it, but like, that's flip got to switch. And it's, it's when it's go time, you guys just got to get up. I think kind of like you said, like putting yourself out there, I think honestly like this past month has been really eye-opening to me in that sense. I think the goal I've given myself um, is to put myself out there and is to try new things, knowing that I don't specifically want to go into a psychology career like you said, you might end up going a different route. Um, I just started applying for stuff, looking at stuff, researching stuff. I got an interview to be like a chiropractic assistant. I didn't go to school for that, but it's health and wellness. That's what I'm interested in. So I might, I might need to. I'm yeah, I'm chiropractic. Yeah. Chiropractic. <laughs> you saw the one with the old lady with the broken spine. Uh, <laughs> I ain't doing all that, but but nah, like good. just just. Testing things out, trying to find a passion, because I think where I'm stuck at right now is that I have a lot of interests, but I haven't found like that specific passion that I'm like, yeah, that's what I want to do the rest of my life. Or, like that's what I really, really love. So, yeah. I think one of the other things too that um, you were kind of hitting on a little bit earlier was goals. Something that kind of helped me to to kind of narrow my focus down was setting my own personal goals. Um, and I think an important thing about that too. For some of your goals, you can share with other people. For others, keep it to yourself. And the reason why I say that is because when you keep some of those goals to yourself, you're going to wake up in the morning thinking about it. Nobody else is going to know it, but when they see it, it's going to be like, dang, like you did that. And you know that you did that because you've been working for it every single day. To have SMART goals, which are what, I, I, don't, I can't think of the acronym right now. It's like 10 o'clock right now, so forget it. <laughs> but I have certain goals that I would like to do during the semester. I have certain goals that I would like to achieve when I graduate. I have certain goals that are long-term. So your five-term, five-year, you know, 10-year goals. Those are some of the things, and those ones in particular, the long-term ones, I kind of keep to myself. Because I want to make sure that by the time I hit 25, I can achieve one of the goals that I want to have. By the time I hit 30, I'll achieve even more of the goals that I want to have. And I plan on doing that by doing this, that, and the third, so I can reach that goal. And so by writing it down, it made my life in particular more purposeful. So that, that's, that's definitely one of the things that's super important. Yeah, I mean, just talking about like our majors and stuff, like one of the things that kind of scares me are those cubicle jobs, you know what I mean? Them, them 40 hour a week jobs, like I, I'm not gonna lie. And I don't wanna bash on them because they are the foundation of our, you know, of our country. That's the back one that's what I'm saying. But at the same time, I was, you know, over the summer, I was, you know, 
2019, you know, working at the airport, working at, you know, a budget rental place. And I see these people who've been working here for 20 years, 30 years. And for me, that just blows my mind. Like it's, it's dead scary just coming back and just repetition, repetition, repetition. And I don't want to, again, I don't want to, that's what I'm saying. I don't want to, you know, hate on those people because they got to do what they got to do to provide for their family. And, you know, I'm not saying their dreams are any less than mine. But at the same time, from my perspective, I just can't see myself doing those types, that type of job, because I feel like I just go crazy. So that's why it makes me even more motivated, like you said, to pour into my passion, to pour into what I want to do, because I don't want to be stuck at one of those jobs where I just do it and I don't care about it. I want to be, you know, I want to feel like my work isn't my work. It's my passion. It's what I'm, it's what I'm doing. And, and that's why, you know, even having you guys on and just doing this podcast, it's, it's it's baby steps but in my brain they are major steps as well because when i came here i didn't even imagine that i would be on camera talking about this i thought i'd just be doing little pieces where i'm doing voiceovers but you know i found a passion that i really like and i think that's one of the most important things like you said you may have many passions but you know finding that one that kind of sticks out from the crowd is so important to me um but you know speaking of that um talking about our passions talking about what we want to do. Do you feel like your time at ASU was well spent? Oh yeah. That's and amazing. you know that can go 30 different ways. It's it's how you interpret it. But did you genuinely feel like you you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish or are accomplishing what your goals were when you came here? Are right, you going to go first? We can go first. Yeah, let Ari go first because she's yeah, at you, you yeah. just finished so. Me personally Looking back at it, I would have done a lot of stuff different, specifically choosing different majors. Uh, like socially wise, friendship wise, I don't regret any of that. I love the people I met, uh, people I stopped being friends with, like thankful for them, all that stuff is fine. Um, but would I have done stuff differently? I just feel like since I graduated early, uh, like I said, went into those hard classes right out of high school, it just felt really rushed and I felt like I didn't really have any time to like make up my mind. I think I came into college psychology, switched to sports business and then switched back to psychology just because I was like, bro, I have no idea what I want to do. Um, so in that sense, I feel like, yeah, I kind of wish I would have done a little thing a little bit different, a little bit differently. Um, I don't like regret ASU or anything, though. I love Arizona, honestly, but. I wish Besides I, the summers, though. Yeah, the summers is deadly. But I wish I, I wish that I would have known more about myself. But, you know, I was an 18-year-old. It was COVID. What am I going to know? Um, so I can't really be mad at myself for that. And it's just like a growing experience from here. Like, I'm just going to find out more and more every day. So. I mean, you know, speaking of that, I, I don't think when you graduate college you're not gonna have the world figured out like it's not it's just it's not gonna happen so i feel like i mean that's what people say you know i'm, I'm scrolling on TikTok. i see all these motivational videos they said <laughs> man the 20s are your time to find out you know TikTok's a lot. To, hey man first of all my TikTok addiction goes crazy <laughs> my TikTok addiction is bad bro yeah the TikTok. this dude will be up at like 4 a.m and all you hear is just TikTok. like just scroll it's bad bro it's bad <laughs> Anytime I see him during his free time, he's gonna be on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah bro. Blast, audio, that man. short form, you know, <laughs> satisfaction. But you know, going back, they talk about how your twenties are your time to, you know, fuck up. Mm -hmm. They're they're your time to experiment. But at the same time, it's like human nature. We want everything now. Right. So I mean, don't. I mean, I don't don't see. I guess don't see your academic. Um, like what you did with your academic as a failure, it's just trial and error. Right. But at the same time, you know, a degree is a degree, so you got something now. You do got something you now. Have something. You, you, you got you a know. piece of paper that said you put in all the hard work. And come on, you graduated in three years. Right? That's, that's not easy to do. Yeah. And to circle back, when when you talked about um, you talked about being motivated and seeing like the people at your job being there for twenty years, it's a simple question, but I like to ask whenever I interview somebody. What motivates you? Like at the end of the day, when you wake up in the morning, what are you getting up for? To be the goat. <laughs> to try and be the greatest at whatever I do, whatever I try to. I agree. Come on, no. Uh, 
about you? I think it's like on this is probably like the most like cliche answer, but I think it's my parents. They are those people who have been at the same job for thirty years. Um, they don't have a college degree. They didn't get the chance to go to. I think my dad went to school for a little bit, you know, but they didn't graduate college. Um, so I'm a first generation college student. So kind of just like yes, yeah, that's first gen, man. <laughs> so seeing kind of like their life and what they've been through. I've always been kind of a go, go, go kind of person, you know, especially right now, like I provide for myself, do all that by myself. Um, my parents are very supportive in like an emotional sense. Um, so I think kind of just seeing them and wanting to be able to give back to them and be able to kind of like show them, give them what they couldn't necessarily give me because they didn't have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I want to buy, yeah, buy my dad all the cars. <laughs> but yeah, kind of just to be able to give them what they couldn't give me just because they didn't have that opportunity or the chance to, not necessarily because they didn't want to. You circle back on that last question because I had a really good answer, but I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was. We'll answer it first. Yeah, I did answer. It was, um, oh, oh, do you what? regret your time at ASU? Oh, yeah, do you think oh. you accomplished? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah. Answer, answer both questions. Woo. That's what I'm about to man. This, this, I got a lot to say about this. So. <laughs> When I first entered ASU, I didn't know what I was going to expect, but I was excited. Being here, obviously, you know, you're going to learn a lot of lessons in life, but I've learned within this, this concentrated amount of time that I've spent here at my three years, the most life lessons that I've ever learned. Um, to get real, real personal, I think all of us have experienced being broke to where you had less than $100. Hey, tell me about it, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't have, have experience. I am experiencing <laughs> it. No, no, no. Big am experiencing. <laughs> and I'm saying, though, like, you know, experiencing that and, and finding out how I can budget myself and budget the money that I got, you know, spending the time and, and how am I spending my time, time management, you're learning lessons continuously. Yeah. And I think even just when it comes from socially, you know, academically, relationships, you learn lessons every single day at college. And I think that that's one of the benefits of actually being in any sort of institution that is, that is a collegiate institution. You know, I, I go back home and I, it's sad to see some of my friends are still back at home doing the same things they're doing in high school. And it's just like, when you go to college, you're not forced to learn, but in a sense you kind of are, because if you do, <laughs> if you mess up, there ain't no, there's nobody to help you. That's on you. And, and you got to learn how, how to, you know, grow up and really make a, an impact for your own life. Because at this point, it's not you fail a course and now you got to take the grade over again. It's not you paying fifty thousand dollars to take the semester again. And I, I, I don't know about y'all, I don't have fifty thousand dollars. So yeah, no, nah. I'm not. I can't mess up. It's the come up right now. Exactly. It's the, it's the chapter to come up. It come up. And I think my biggest thing is recognizing, even though I'm twenty years old, I'm not grown. Hell no. Nah. I, I am not grown. We are, but we're not. He said, no, I'm going to say I'm not grown. And I think one of the biggest, le like, that was one of the lessons that I learned from, from an individual. And he first told me, he said, I'm not grown. He was around 60 years old. And he said, I will never be grown. Because if you say that you're grown, you have stopped learning. And I feel like one of the biggest things, that's a quote yeah, right there. That's, look, that's fine. that stuck with me because I realized there's always going to be be things that I'm gonna end up having to learn continuously throughout time. Even if it's not academic, it could be a life lesson, it could be anything. And if you are not hungry to keep learning, you, you're just gonna be stagnant, like I said earlier. And you never want stagnation. So I feel like that's the, the, one of the biggest things that you learn while in college, is learning to accept the fact that you're not growing. And life will, life will tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> life I mean, and experiences will tell you that. And then talk about, you know, what motivates you to keep going? You know, what's the, deep down at the center of it, what's your motivation to wake up in the morning and keep going, to go get it? There's two things. It's me against me, and I've been hit with so much stuff that my mindset right now is so solidified that I, I just can't fail. Like, I, I literally just cannot fail because I've been through so much worst things within my life and my personal. You know, I'm diagnosed with epilepsy by the age of three. I was not supposed to be taking classes at a collegiate level. Like, literally, my doctor told me that. 
and I have side effects of having epilepsy, but I was able to become the 2020 advocate for the state of California for mm. people that have epilepsy. Mm. I was bullied throughout my whole life, and now I get back to the people that don't have a community. Mm. And so doing things like that is what, what really drives me every single day because I realize even though there's going to be opposition for you every single day, you can make an impact on yourself and other people continuously. There's always going to be people that are not going to want to see you succeed, and you're not going to you're yeah, not man. going to see you succeed too. If you got if you got you know if you don't got haters, you got popping. Exactly. Yeah. You know what exactly. I'm saying? I love my haters. Hey, I man. absolutely love my haters, and I think that that's just a, a you know that's just a testament within itself. That's all I had to say about that. You know, going back to the me versus me. This might be a little bit of a toxic mindset, but when I don't do things correct, and I know I didn't give my all. Or I know that there's somebody else in front of me where I could be. I'm not gonna blame them. I'm gonna figure out what they did so I can be that person that's gonna be in time. Yeah, that's not toxic. I don't want to say no, that's I toxic. That's, that's motivation. motivation. Yeah, that's motivation. Hey, man. David is Barack Obama Jr. David got me motivated right now. <laughs> David, it's, 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 it's 1045 and David got me motivated. <laughs> hey, man, I'm telling you, um, you know, kind of speaking on my motivation, kind of like Ariana. Um, it's a different sense for me because my parents aren't from here. They're from Africa. And seeing their journey, seeing my dad come over at 18, 19, you know, not knowing the soul, not knowing how to speak English. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like seeing my mom come over, you know, she was pregnant, holding up the family, working as a nurse. I, I got no excuse. Yeah. I got no excuse at all. I mean, it's, it's a different type of motivation, especially when, when they tell you those stories of, you know, my dad being back home, having to leave his whole family, yeah. you know, to pursue a, That's a you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's different. Well, I'll say too, I talked to, we, when we went to Colorado this past week, hey, bro, I'll be a, yeah, bro, I'll be a, Shout out when to I talked to your dad, bro, he like, oh yeah, that's a serious bro, man, Gabe don't it. mess around, man. Hey, well, when he was just talking about like everything that he had to go through, bro, like, it's, it's different, he has a, a different perspective on life, and, you know, not to, you know, I take, I think we all take living in the U.S. for granted. So being able to not, and that's why I feel like, you know, when I was in high school, my experience going back to Ethiopia, seeing where my dad came from, they didn't have electricity. They don't have running water. You know what I mean? They, my dad went from there to being able to go back and, you know, build a school for the community, build resources, build a hospital. You know what I mean? So it only motivates me more and, you know, they're still not, you know, at the top. They're not millionaires, but they made a good living for themselves. Yeah, right. And for me, I want to be the next person. You know, I want to be the breadwinner for the family. Yeah, I want to take the, the next man. step. I want to be the one to say, Mom and Dad, you've done enough. Just chill out now. Right, I, I got it covered. Nah, we're not going to be in the mountains, man. We're going to be. Where you going? Hollywood, LA? I might put a year down there. <laughs> go live in Spain or something off the coast. Hey, shout out to Spain. Come on, man. Sipping yeah, margaritas, sipping, you know. But, you know, that's my motivation personally. I want to be the brand when I want to take care of the fam, you know. And, you know, I, I really feel like this could be my way out. You know, whether it's this podcast or just the media side, I feel like, shit, I feel like I was born for this, for Can real. Can I say something, yeah. too? Yeah. College is not for everybody. Hell no. <laughs> Going back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, if it means trade school, if it means working at a, a shipyard, if it means going to the military, find a way to make your life a success. College is not for everybody. And I think, you know, we often see college, or a lot of folks see college. I'm not saying that I don't endorse college because it works for me. But if you cannot find your way in college, find something that works for you. Because it's just like, bro, like, we need technicians. We need, you know, plumbers. We need trade jobs. That's what well, keeps no. America going, that's what keeps any country going. Hey, know? yeah, and success is, it, there's not one definition for success. Success exactly. is anything. Yeah, success, you can work your way up through anything, like any job, any place. I mean, obviously there's limitations to some, to some things, but yeah. yeah. Success is, there's no, I don't think there's any ceiling to success. And like, just to circle back to like the motivation thing for me, I think just seeing my parents every day be consistent with what they do. Every day seeing my dad, Go to go to work, come back, do it, do extra things like come coach. He coached my basketball team from when I was, let me, like coach six years yeah. <laughs> since yeah. I was like oh, six man. years old to uh, to up until high school. Like just 
going to train me or going going the extra mile, I think even for my mom, just really with the education side, ever since I was a baby, she was just on top of me. Like every and every I, day. I, 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 had to, I had to read, I had to write, I had to do something. That's what I'm saying. At the time you it may feel like torture, but you know, yeah. hindsight is twenty twenty. You just see like you yeah. see how much work and love and support that they put in. Man, some parents are out here, they don't care. They leave their baby, they don't care. They live in their life. So yeah. them sat, seeing that sacrifice is different too, man. Yeah, seeing that and just, I just want to, I just want to, it's almost like I want to win for them. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I want them to come one day just to sit back, relax, and just, I can be like, I got this. Like, this is... Not like this is my like I'm the head of the family now because it's, it's always going to be yeah like you that. think he's yeah. the hunch or yeah. not <laughs> but like <laughs> but like where they can just literally just be proud of me and think all the work that they put in all the time hours that they put in to make me successful it paid off for them in the long run that's that's what motivates me yeah that's something um, one of the other things too that both of y'all are really hitting on and I don't think that you had the word for it was respecting your brand and protecting your brand. What I mean by that is, when you enter any space, people are going to go based off of who you are. And when you start to develop relationships, they're going to get to know who you are, and they're going to know who supported you. And that could be family, that could be friends, that could be you know your church, that could be anybody. And I feel like for me, you know, as a young adult in particular, especially within this generation, there are so many ways and so many traps that we have. Just at the look, this phone, you, you have access to. A bunch of nonsense <laughs> that will fill your mind yeah, with nonsense. TikTok, TikTok. <laughs> you know? But I feel like for me, when it comes to what I do, I make it purposeful because I recognize my brand and what I support and who endorses me. So I feel like, you know, going back to both what the question was and also the previous question, that's my drive, that's my motivation to keep going. Because I recognize that my, my mom, my dad, you know, my, my family, my friends, and everybody else that supports me. They're looking at me, yeah. and I'm representing them. So yeah. And real quick, let's let's switch the subject just while we wrap up the podcast. What do y'all do in y'all's free time to just relax? Like, what is? Let's end, let's end off the podcast that way. Like, yeah. yeah on a, on a good smooth note. On a smooth note. note what do what what do y'all do for fun? I think people want to know that we go to Arizona State University. Obviously, it's, it's some things that we can't talk about on the podcast, but just like. Uh, a good yeah, little just, over here. Yeah, just like <laughs> <laughs> just just like a little overview. What do you guys do to relax? Is it music? Is it sports? What is it? You want me to go? Yeah. All right. So I think that that's one of the best things that um, I've been focusing on this this past year is recognizing how I can relax with my mind, my body, and my soul. Um, because by getting connected and being in everybody's face, it's draining. You know, I'm, I'm just gonna be honest. Like it's draining, and like the the way that I was pushing myself between the past two years, obviously, is great that I was able to be a part of the BAC. It's great that I was a part of the It's great that I was a part of BDSA and doing all the other things that I was doing. But it made me put into perspective when I started to get drained, and I was coming to school, you know, just not focused. I was coming to work, and always grumpy, always angry, you know, that I needed to really start focusing and pouring into myself. I think that, that one of the ways that I was able to really start doing that is obviously I think, y'all know this, I love music. Yeah. I absolutely love music. I, I can get into any genre. David, you got to talk about your dancing too. Yeah. When you talk about music, you got to talk about your dancing, bro. Please, please, tell the people about how much you love dancing too. You have to. You have to. Ah, wait, before, this man will be, 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 be in the little aura. 18. Uh, he's in the little that circle. Uh, breaking that down. Uh, yeah. uh, he used to hit the. Uh, he used to he hit, hit the ball. Right, 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 man. Hey, the hey he would have a lit. Oh, yeah. Hey, he that show the Lord real quick, man. Show the Lord real quick, man. Uh, 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 yeah. You see, he got to uh, uh, put it in reverse and everything. But, hey, talk yeah, about it. So, you know, I, I love dancing too, and I feel like, you know, finding some way of creative expression is also important. For some people, they like to journal, some people, they like to draw. Um, other people, they may like fashion, putting fabrics together, putting pieces together. For me, it's, it's dancing, you know? Um, that's my way of relieving stress, that's my way of relieving my emotions, and also just expressing myself. Um, but going back to the, the original question at hand, um, one of the things that I really started focusing on uh, was reading. And I feel like reading, really expands your mind past, you know, the limits that you think that, 
or you probably didn't even know that you had. And it's just informative. Having a, a paperback book or a hardcover book, you know, just sitting there reading and, and increasing your knowledge is a, is, a, is a theme that you, I think, actually everybody needs to have. Because I, I used to, I'll be honest, I used to see reading as a chore. You know, writing no book reports about books that I really didn't care about. But it's, it's books that are meaningful that really start to improve your livelihood. The Alchemist, you know, that's, that's my favorite book of all time. That's, that is a book that shows, you know, passion, that shows purpose, that, that really is a direction for, I think, if anybody's watching this, anybody listening to this, all y'all need to read that book. It's a short read, it's a great book about finding your purpose. And I think finding other books, you know, the psychology of money, when it comes to learning about personal finance and you're developing your personal finance, I'm now investing. I'm now finding out about real estate. I'm finding out ways that I can expand my money, make my money, make money. And so finding, you know, whatever it may be, whether it's books, journaling, just something to increase your mental, your soul, and your spirit. Um, so those are just some of the things that I do. Also football team. For me, uh, first of all, what David said was real. Um, at ASU, I was a part of the BAC, the BSU downtown. I was uh, black artists and designers too. And being in people's faces all the time was so draining. Um, I feel like by the end of the year, I, I feel like to be in like those leadership, leadership positions, you do have to like, you have to be there for other people a lot and sometimes not yourself. Um, but I think since I graduated too, I've been wanting to pour more so into myself. I honestly, I haven't found the time to do that yet. Um, but I think what I've been wanting to do, I love music as well. Um, I grew up playing piano, violin, dancing, all that. Um, and when I do find the time and money, what I've been talking about with my dad and my mom is finding time to go take classes again and kind of find that love and passion and calmness in what it used to be for me. Because right now it's just work, 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 work. That's all I do. Um, <laughs> I'm not in people's faces as much anymore just because I'm not in that college setting as much. Um, I still pop out to the events sometimes just because it's where my friends are at. But I think just finding something I used to love and kind of bringing that back and finding that love again is going to help me a lot. And it's just been a tough time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think that wraps it up, man. That's this is probably the best podcast. This is a great podcast, this hey man. The time podcast. flew. I'm not gonna yeah, lie, time man. Flew. Yeah, We're man. checking the time. People got stuff to do. David, David got a 14 page essay he got to do. I think no, we, we, yeah, that's our college life right that's there. College life, man. Hey man, 14 but, pages is crazy. Hey man, 14 pages is insane. I don't know if I've ever wrote, written. 14 pages at once. I had a class that gave me 15 pages. I dropped it. Once you, once you saw that, you was done. Yeah, I was not going to do it. That's what I'm saying. But, you know, David, Ariana, it was a pleasure as always. Um, I know they enjoyed it. They had to have it. David was dropping knowledge left and right, bombs left and right. You know what I'm saying? This was, in terms of, like, knowledge and I think just, like, a good conversation. It was just flowing. The flow was great. But, you know. We'll have this posted, you know, sometime soon. Um, by now, the vlog should be up, so y'all check that out. Hey, I'm check sure. out the vlog, man. Yeah, yeah, man. Come on, good content. The vlog. They, they, they got to see. They got to see. Yeah, it. They got good content. See, they saw. They saw. It's the not like a real yeah. YouTube, you know, vlog, man. So for it. But like we said, like we said in the podcast, that we just gotta stay consistent with it. Stay consistent, man. Stay motivated. As David said, man, stay motivated, stay consistent. Go oriented. Go oriented. And until next time, this is teed up. We'll see y'all next time. Peace. Peace.